This week on Focus Asia. Spreading fire. How Islamic militant groups in Southeast Asia are responding to the war on terror. Hanging on for dear life. The wildlife refuge offering a second chance for Indonesia's orangutans. Electrifying performances. The conducting charisma of India's Zubin Mehta. Hello from Hong Kong and welcome to Focus Asia. I'm Mark New. Since the September 11th terrorist attacks in America, the U.S., backed by an international coalition, has focused on its prime suspect, Osama bin Laden, and members of his organization, Al-Qaeda. The war on terrorism has also turned attention on other Islamic militant groups in Asia, most specifically those in Indonesia and the Philippines. These groups once boasted of links to bin Laden, but now many for their own survival are trying to put as much distance between themselves and Al-Qaeda as possible. Jennifer Lee examines the East Asian terrorist links and the denials. In Indonesia's Molokas Islands, a holy war rages. It's a bloody battle between Muslims and Christians, provoked by one of the country's most notorious Muslim fundamentalist groups, the Lasker Jihad. In nearby southern Philippines, more violence. Three Islamic militant groups are battling separately for an independent Islamic state. Among the most violent, the Abu Sayyaf. Besides their struggle for control, these Muslim fundamentalist groups have something else in common. They've been linked to Osama bin Laden and his terrorist network, Al-Qaeda. Jafar Umar Talib is the commander of the Lasker Jihad. Like bin Laden, he fought against the Soviets in Afghanistan in the mid-1980s. Since September 11, though, Jafar has been distancing himself from his old peer. We do not have any link with Al-Qaeda, nor with other groups throughout the world. In terms of Al-Qaeda, we completely oppose them, both in their principles and their ideology. The denial is not surprising, given the government's vow since September 11th to snuff out terrorism on the home front. Jafar is also trying to get on the better side of the government. He's lobbying Indonesia's lawmakers to endorse Sharia law, which he and his followers recently declared in the Moluccas without government approval. The Darul Islam, another militant Muslim organization in Indonesia, also fought alongside bin Laden in Afghanistan, sending in more than 30,000 troops. Despite his obvious support for bin Laden, the group's leader says he has no links with the Saudi exile or Al-Qaeda. But you don't have direct links to Al-Qaeda? Uh, actually, I don't have. I would like to say that I have a, a direct link to an or some or something, but yeah, I cannot tell the lie to the public. In the Philippines, links between the Abu Sayyaf and bin Laden are much harder to deny. Abu Sayyaf founder Abdurajak Janjalani fought alongside bin Laden in Afghanistan, where he learned to use weapons and make bombs. Intelligence sources say bin Laden's brother-in-law, Mohammed Jamal Khalifa, also played a crucial role in establishing the Abu Sayyaf. In the late 80s and early 90s, Khalifa headed the Philippine branch of the International Islamic Relief Organization, a charity widely believed to have channeled money through its bank accounts to groups like the Abu Sayyaf. He was here in the late 80s and early 90s, established this uh, NGO and uh, established uh, other businesses, got married to two Filipinas. I understand that this IRO, being an NGO, would also give uh, support uh, to various activities that would appear to be harmless. But uh, in our opinion, this was one way of uh, generating goodwill, one way of uh, finding recruits, and uh, one way of getting a support base. The International Islamic Relief Organization, however, maintains its innocence. It denies knowingly giving funds to the Abu Sayyaf. We don't ask people where they belong. Are you Abu Sayyaf or are you what, whatever group you belong? Uh, we, we help people as a victims and as a needy people. Philippine officials say hard evidence linking the Abu Sayyaf and Al-Qaeda dates back to 1996. 
They say investigations have yielded no signs international terrorists are still at work here. Those signs, though, would be difficult to detect. In 1995, an al-Qaeda cell was discovered in the Philippines only when a bomb its members were making accidentally exploded in a Manila apartment. That apartment belonged to Ramzi Youssef, who was later arrested for the 1993 bombing of the World Trade Center. Given this history, the Philippines is taking no chances. Since September 11th, it has moved to eliminate potential terrorists. To check the spread of terrorism, President Gloria Macabagal Arroyo says she will also attack poverty. It is evil that causes terrorism, but the evil wants, needs to spread its ideology to have a mass base. And that mass base um, uh, will have as its best uh, breeding ground the areas where, there, where there's poverty. The Philippines has also permitted American military advisors to work alongside its military to give it technical assistance in fighting the Abu Sayyaf. The plan may backfire. Muslims have long resented the presence of American troops in the Islamic world in general, in the Philippines in particular. If we can only ease the tension in, may, in many parts of the Islamic world by, you know, uh, acceding to the basic demands of many Muslim governments, and in, including movements for the United States to loosen its grip, particularly in the, in the Islamic world, in the Middle East, I think half of the problem is solved and half of Islamic movements would simply fade away. But if the United States would continue to control, to engage in, in, in hegemony, in, you know, in extend its neo-colonialism in many parts of the Islamic world, you can expect reverberations. Those reverberations have already started happening. Immediately after the launch of U.S. airstrikes on Afghanistan, Muslim protesters flooded the streets of Jakarta. On the forefront of the demonstrations, the Islamic Defenders Front, or FPI, another of Indonesia's militant Islamic groups. Claiming seven million members, the FPI established in 1998 with aims to build a society ruled by Islamic law. In the past year, it has been blamed for several attacks on nightclubs and bars around the country. Since the airstrikes began last month, it has been threatening to hunt down Americans and expel them. The relationship between Muslim groups around the world is one of Islamic solidarity. It's a relationship based on faith and belief. So even though we don't know Osama bin Laden personally, we are connected to him by our faith. We're not going to let him be crushed by a country like America. Indonesian President Megawati Sukarnoputri is treading cautiously, trying to balance support for a crucial ally and concern for an increasingly restive Muslim population. This video of a training camp, taken by a member of the Daru Islam, might reflect the combative mood of the country's Islamic militants. It is just one of several training camps reportedly operating in Indonesia. Though most Muslims in this country practice a moderate brand of Islam, the tattered state of law enforcement here could provide an opening for opportunistic extremists. Likewise, in the Philippines, the sheer presence of violent Islamic militants puts the country at risk of remaining a breeding ground for terrorism. The government insists ties between al-Qaeda and the Abu Sayyaf are long past. In any case, the separatist group has since evolved into a self-funding criminal organization, taking hostages for money. Experts say even if bin Laden were captured, there's no reason to believe the Abu Sayyaf and other Asian Islamic militants would not take up his cause. It's not only the Abu Sayyaf that supports uh, bin Laden. It's practically all oppressed, you know, Muslim peoples in many parts of the world. Because they can, you know, they can relate to the cause of bin Laden. For instance, their view that the Muslim world is oppressed. Okay? It's under a hegemony by the United States. Their view that um, the Middle East must not have uh, you know, the presence of American troops, they are the same. Their view that uh, the United States should not continuously back up Israel. This is what makes a Ben Laden. In other words, even if you will able to eliminate Ben Laden today, expect new Ben Ladins in the future if you will not address some of these basic uh, 
from Ips. Coming up on Focus Asia, how maestro Zubin Mehta keeps his Asian roots in time with his fast tempo career. And wild at heart, an Indonesian refuge swings into action to save Asia's last great apes. Orangutan is one of the most gentle of Southeast Asia's wild creatures. Yet for years, they have been victims of a brutal trade in which adults are killed so the young can be turned into pets. Facing extinction in less than a decade, the last hope for these animals may lie in a new refuge being set up in Indonesia. Adrian Brown now reports on a woman who left a high-flying job to help save Asia's last great apes. You don't have a very cute laugh, you know that? <laughs> you do not. <laughs> She's a mother to 82, doting on each and every one of them. You seem very attached to this little one. Well, I should rather say he's more attached to me than I am. <laughs> no, I'm not attached to all of them. Some of these baby primates were rescued from rich households where they'd been kept as novelty pets. Others were orphaned, often after witnessing the slaying of their mothers by poachers. His mother was shot um, with a, what do you call it, a shotgun with small pellets. Yeah, they all have been traumatized in some ways. Um, the mothers have either been shot, they've been um, killed with machetes. Um, if they go into the big palm oil plantations, and normally the trees are very low and they can be you know, killed with machetes. Their guardian today is Lone Drosha Nielsen, a former flight attendant from Denmark. She tired of the airline business a decade ago, devoting her life instead to creatures that she says are only slightly less demanding than business class passengers. Oh, you have to love them dearly. They also know who really loves them and who doesn't. You can tell by the way that they react towards you. I mean, it's obvious that you know, I love them more than anything else, and they know that. She's behind a groundbreaking project in Indonesian Borneo that could just hold the key to the survival of Asia's last great ape. It's part clinic and part wildlife sanctuary. The idea is to teach the orangutan the skills they would have learned from their mothers. Eventually, they'll be returned to the wild, hopefully to reproduce there to replace the dwindling orangutan population, now down to 25,000 in Sumatra and Borneo. This is the smallest one. He was only two months old when we first got him. In fact, Martizan weighed just two kilos when he was brought to the center, a few days after his mother was shot by poachers. Today, Martizan is a bundle of health and mischief. Lone clearly loves orangutans, but in the past, her husband has had a very different relationship with them. This indigenous Dayak tribesman was once partial to orangutan meat. Not anymore, though, says this reformed hunter. I try to, to tell my, my family we cannot eat orangutan anymore because this is the uh, endangered species. It's easy to see why the orangutan remains endangered. Nearby, what was once pristine rainforest. Today, a desolate landscape. The legacy of the devastating forest fires that swept Borneo in 1997. This is where the orangutan used to live. But the forest has barely started to recover. The destruction forced them out of their natural habitat and eventually into contact with humans. Lone has had a tip-off that the owner of this house wants to sell an orangutan. And here it is, in full view, chained to a post. 
It is illegal to keep orangutans as pets, an offence too to trade in these supposedly protected creatures. Lone can only report what she found to the local police and hope for the best. Down the road, and without trying very hard, we discovered another orangutan being held captive in equally squalid surroundings. Shaved and overweight, it was a pitiful sight. She belonged to a local bar owner. To the customers, it was just an animal that looked funny. Something to laugh at. What it really seemed to want, though, was affection. She's living on, on cakes and milk. Right. She doesn't get any vegetables or fruit. She's just on a very bad diet. As well as being the bar's only real attraction, she's also been trained to do the washing up. A freak show by night, domestic helper by day. The rings on its fingers a sign the owners have forgotten it's just an animal. An illegal trade in these wild animals now flourishes in Indonesia. Local people are struggling to make ends meet, but some know they can sell a captured orangutan for around five dollars, a figure that's multiplied many times through a network of dealers in Jakarta. Back at the center, we learn just how far some owners are prepared to go in domesticating their household pets. PP, this is from the Chinese uh, woman. They have a three orangutan in one house. But this is three? The, three. As pets? Yeah. So they're very domesticated? Yes, that's right. Um, she has uh, breastfeeding with the uh, uh, Chinese woman, PP. Breastfed? Yeah. Seen the small baby. They have uh, the picture. The, you can uh, you can see that's who. So the Chinese woman would breastfeed the people. People. Yes. The natural habitat on which the orangutan depends for its survival is disappearing faster than ever. Environmentalists claim that up to 70 percent of the trees supplied to the processing sector are logged illegally. And so if the orangutan is taken as an indicator of the ecological health of this region, then the prospects for this endangered species are not encouraging. Could the orangutan be extinct 20, 30, 40 years from now? They will not be extinct 30 or 40 years from now. They will be extinct probably 10 years from now if the, the, um, the extensive locking is continuous the way it is right now. That soon? Yes. She fears the orangutan may never be able to return to the wild. And with good reason. Fly over central Kalimantan and you witness the processes that are destroying hundreds of thousands of hectares of tropical rainforest every year. The burning of the forest for land clearing projects once more coating the area in thick choking haze. It is my worst nightmare is to think about the fact that I'm never going to be able to find a place that is going to be safe in which in an area which I can release orangutans. This sanctuary perhaps the only place they are now truly safe in Indonesia. Still ahead on Focus Asia, South Asian magic behind the music making of Zubin Mehta. His career has spanned nearly five decades, with one groundbreaking achievement after another. At age 23, he was the youngest guest conductor at the famous Vienna Philharmonic. Only three years later, Zubin Mehta had the Los Angeles Philharmonic under his baton, and soon he would be leading two major North American orchestras at the same time. But many in the music world still don't realize this famous maestro hails from India, a heritage Zubin Mehta is very proud of. His visual impact is a very important part of his art. 
it, it's something that comes out of him uh, and is brought out by the music. Zubin is one of the only conductors in the world who conducts without a score. I mean, all conductors have great memories, but Zubin's got one of the best. Passion. Charisma. And a whole lot of talent. Zubin Mehta is one of the world's foremost conductors. He's performed in more than 1,600 concerts on five different continents. The finest orchestras in the world just keep calling him back. His musical impulse is a very genuine one. And he's able to communicate very, very strongly what he feels. And uh, he, he has got that rare quality, which not all performers have though many tried. Right from the very beginning, Zubin was surrounded by music. His father, Meili Mehta, founded the Bombay Symphony. At 18, Zubin attended the prestigious Academy of Music in Vienna. Just seven years later, he was conducting both the Vienna and Berlin Philharmonics. It would be impossible to list all of his achievements since then, but among his highlights, director of the New York Philharmonic, director of the Bavarian State Opera in Munich, and conductor of the legendary Three Tenors concerts in Los Angeles and Rome. But through all the accolades and ovations, Zubin not only takes pride in what he does, but also in who he is. I wish more people in the world would just know that I'm Indian. This is my problem. I sit in a train in Italy or on a plane in South America. I always know the Indian on the plane, but he doesn't know me as an Indian. I don't care that he doesn't know my name. Or, that, that doesn't bother me at all. He doesn't even know I'm Indian. This bothers me. Zubin Mehta was born in Bombay, also known as Mumbai. He is a Parsi, a small ethnic minority group originally from Persia. More than 1,200 years ago, Parsis sought refuge in India after facing religious persecution in their homeland. He's a very proud Parsi. And I think he's made not only the Parsis of India, but I think all of us Indians, he's made us all very proud. The way he travels, I mean, that guy can go through three countries in, in one day, but he has still retained his Indian passport. And, uh, and he says he'll never give it up. Zubin has never shied away from politics. During the Vietnam War, he organized concerts for peace on California campuses. Zubin once refused to perform in South Africa under apartheid as the country failed to accept his demands that the audience be composed of mixed races. Likewise, he refused to perform in Malaysia when organizers insisted he drop a piece by Leonard Bernstein. Zubin says they had a problem with so-called Jewish influences in the music. Zubin does have strong ties with Israel, having performed there for 40 years. He's been declared a music director for life by the Israel Philharmonic Orchestra. Throughout the country's turbulent history, Zubin's music has never stopped. People of Israel need music at all times. So when there's a war going on, it doesn't mean they don't go to the concert that evening. It's a strange situation. It's a very tiny country, and yet the soldiers who were on the front two days ago come back and go with their family to the concert. So we never stopped playing during the Yom Kippur War or the Gulf Crisis. To say that Zubin is a workaholic is a major understatement. He often rehearses all day, takes an hour break, and then goes on stage until midnight. Nancy Mehta, a former actress from the United States, has been married to Zubin for more than 30 years. Well, I didn't know that he was married to his orchestra and his work. I don't think anyone young and marrying knows that. And uh, I remember saying to my husband, uh, 
well, what happened to the weekends? Well, you knew I would. I said, no, I never knew that you had to work every weekend, Saturday and Sunday, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Tremendous amount of adjustment. Zubin admits that devotion to his work has caused family strife. I have neglected so much that has to do with my family. I should have been more with my children. I should be even more today with my grandchildren. But uh, they're gypsies. At 65 years old, Zubin still has dreams. Dreams of playing in Arab countries with the Israel Philharmonic. Dreams of playing in Afghanistan, that is, only if it's before an audience of men and women. But despite the ambition, Zubin may finally be learning to relax. He just returned from a huge vacation with his wife, a whole three days. Never mind that it was a trip his wife had planned on four previous occasions, but canceled due to Zubin's schedule. My wife is almost all the time with me, and I want it that way. And uh, it has grown really through the years uh, that, that we are not only great friends, but uh, we are each other's advisors. And thank God we have a similar taste in so many things that when she told me to get up today, to look at the Taj Mahal by sunrise, I agreed immediately. The music making of Zubin Mehta. And that's all we have time for on this edition of Focus Asia. I'm Mark New in Hong Kong. See you next week.